Welcome to heaven. Would you choose to live in a town where everything was always right and everyone was always nice, in exchange for simply never questioning how it came to be? I never thought I would be the kind of person to give up my free will in a subtle way like this. But in this specific case, the perks simply did outweigh the costs. It all began after my aunt passed away. We weren't very close. My mother and her had lost touch in the past years and so I was more than surprised to hear that I had inherited her house. A house I'd never even visited before. Not even for her funeral, as she'd requested in her will that it should be held in the town where she and my mother were born. Despite her generosity, I never intended to move there. I believed I was too young to be living in my own house in a tiny town that was incredibly secluded. Instead, I asked my boyfriend to join me on the five-hour drive to check the place out, and put it up for sale. As we drove past the sign that read, Welcome to Heaven in big cursive letters, it was as if we'd stepped into the set of a movie. The side of the road was lined with big apple trees that all looked exactly the same. They were bright green, flecked with huge red apples. The road we drove down became significantly smoother, birds were chirping, and we saw a small river glowing in the sun. And that was only the beginning. The closer we got to the center of town, the more beautiful it became. We passed little farm stands that were made to look like strawberries, blueberries, and figs. There was a bakery inside a brick house omitting scents of vanilla and warm butter, and cafes with people sitting in the front. I slowed the gas to look into different types of shops selling clothes and jewelry. For a town so small it had anything you could wish for. I thought this would be some boring little village, Ian mumbled from the passenger seat. Me too, I agreed. But it's so nice. We pulled into the street of my aunt's old home. There were houses in all types of colors with small chimneys and cute little front yards where people were tanning in the sun or watering their plants. Some waved at us as we passed them, and to our surprise, most of them didn't seem much older than us. This should be it. I said as we reached house number seven. We walked up the gravel to the front door and I rummaged through my purse for the key, but surprisingly, the door was unlocked. As I stepped over the threshold, I noticed that I smelled like cinnamon, as if someone had been baking in the kitchen very recently. Ian followed close behind, the two bags with clothes and stuff we'd brought hanging over his shoulders. Wow, he mumbled, and I felt the sentiment. It wasn't anything major, not a huge hall or anything like that, but the interior just felt so homely and nice. There was a small fireplace in the living room. Everything was still furnished. There was no television, but a massive shelf filled with hundreds of books. We continued to the kitchen, and I opened a few cupboards, which were all fully stocked. Ian opened the fridge and turned to me with a confused look on his face. Did your aunt live on her own? He asked. Yeah, I think so. Why? He pulled out a carton of milk, opened the lid, and smelled it. The stuff in here looks fresh. I joined him and saw the fridge full of produce, cheeses, and meats. Not a single thing rotten. Aunt Maggie had died a month ago. That's really odd, I whispered. I moved away from the kitchen and found the staircase leading upstairs to where the bedroom and bathroom were. On top of the bed, I found a letter addressed to me. My dearest Eleanor, you might have been surprised to receive this present. When I got ill, I wondered whose life I could make infinitely better, and I ultimately landed on you. You are in the prime of your life and deserve happiness. So now I am giving this home to you, and as you will soon learn, it will be the very best thing that ever happened to you. Enjoy it with all your heart. You will learn that you never have to endure stress again. You won't feel anger or sadness, only luck. And there's only one thing you need to do in exchange. Never question why. I called my mum to tell her that we'd arrived safely. She'd been a little suspicious of the whole thing at first, and when I told her about the letter, it didn't exactly ease her mind. My aunt had moved away when she was in her late twenties. She was a good bit younger than my mother. After she moved to this town, they lost more and more touch, and I believe my mother was afraid the same thing would happen to me. She hadn't even known that her own sister was sick until it was too late. I convinced her that we would only be staying for a little while and that I had every intention to simply sell the house and get back home. 
That was the only time I called my mother the entire time we were in heaven. After that call, I left my phone on the desk in the bedroom and didn't pick it up again. I simply didn't feel the need. The following morning, our doorbell woke me from the best dreamless sleep I had in years. Ian wasn't next to me, but I smelled fresh coffee downstairs. When I got down, Ian was already on his way to the door. I walked up next to him, and we were greeted by five friendly strangers with a big basket in the hand of one of them. Welcome, they all said in unison. Two of them were women, and three were men, and they did all look very different, but somehow still similar. They had the same posture, the same cheery grin, and similar sets of workout clothes that I immediately envied. The tallest of them stretched out his arms, gesturing us to take the basket. Wow, is this for us? I asked. The basket was filled with chocolates, bath oils, lotion, fruits, and a bunch of other fancy-looking items. Well, yes, of course, one of the women said as she linked arms with the tall guy. She had golden hair that shimmered in the warm sun and freckles all over her cheeks. We saw you arriving yesterday but didn't want to bother you on your first day. You're Eleanor, right? Ian and I exchanged a look. Yeah, but you can call me Elle, I laughed. And this is my boyfriend, Ian. Lovely. I'm Lee, and this is my husband, Mark. The others introduced themselves as well, but I immediately forgot their names again. Did you settle in well? Mark asked. Yeah, I mean it almost feels like a hotel, Ian answered. The whole house is fully stocked. It's kind of crazy. The five neighbors exchanged a look I couldn't quite place. It almost appeared like confusion. But I didn't find any personal things from my aunt. This used to be her home. I thought we'd have to pack her things or something. Stop right there, honey, Lee interrupted me. She grabbed my wrist and squeezed it so hard I thought it might bruise. Don't question it, just enjoy. She winked at me and added, I hope we become marvelous friends. Oh well, we're actually not planning to stay very long, Ian said. They all started laughing hysterically. One of the guys from the back wiped away a tear and said, You'll change your mind. With that, they turned around and left. The ease I'd felt that morning suddenly turned sour. Where the actual hell are we, L? This feels like the Truman Show, Ian laughed after we'd closed the door again. But we had yet to learn how right they actually were. Because as the day came to an end, we'd both agreed to throw our plans of selling the house aboard and stay forever. I can't say for how long we'd been in heaven, days or possibly weeks. You know the old expression, time flies when you're having fun. Ian was gone for the afternoon to play tennis with Mark. It was the very first time since our arrival that I felt the smallest sense of boredom. It wasn't a bad feeling, simply one that prompted me to find something to do. And so I decided to do something I hadn't done in a while. Read a book. I picked up the first one that looked interesting from the shelf and flicked through it, but for some reason, I couldn't read it. Must be a different language, I mumbled to myself. I picked up the next one, but it was the same, and the one after that, and the one after that. All these books were simply decorations I realized and laughed. What a fun way to fill a shelf. I almost turned away to find another thing to do when one specific book caught my attention. It was tiny, smaller even than my palm, and didn't fit in with all the rest. It almost disappeared in between them. I pulled it out with my fingernails, and when I opened it up, a piece of paper, folded multiple times, fell out of it. I picked it up from the ground and opened it only to realize that there was writing on it. Writing I could understand. I have to write this down because I always forget again. I don't remember when I came here. I don't remember why. Everyone is always so nice. Why are they so nice? My neighbor Trisha started talking about her family. It made me wonder if I have one too. I found Trisha in her hallway. All the blood was drained from her body. Where did all her blood go? Two men appeared next door. They went into Trisha's house and came back out with a big black plastic bag. Nobody here gets to grow old. I remembered someone, Lucy and her little girl. What was her name again? My breathing stopped at the mention of the name. Lucy was my mother. The paper held only one more sentence after it. I will be in the black bag soon. I know it. Aunt Maggie had written these, probably shortly before her death, and if the content wasn't strange already, I noticed that the handwriting looked very different from the one on the letter I found on the first day. 
I sat in the living room for so long that I didn't even notice when it got dark or when Ian came home. There was so much fog around my mind that I didn't even react when he turned on the lights or when he kissed my forehead or when he put up a fire in our chimney. L, what's that in your lap? He suddenly asked. I looked down at the piece of paper with the last words I'd ever read from my aunt and swallowed down a hard knot. I, I found this. He grabbed the paper and his eyes scanned the page. Then he crumbled it without another word and threw it into the fire. Let's forget this ever happened, he smiled brightly, showing all his teeth, and then proceeded to go to the kitchen to start dinner. The following day I did just what Ian said and tried to forget all about the strange letter. My aunt had been sick after all. It was no use to think about anything, really. We were happy after all, and I wouldn't have wanted that to change for anything in the world. And I would have continued living on like that, happy and oblivious if it hadn't been for the intruders in our home. Ian and I had spent the day at the local community pool, tanning in the sun, going for a swim, and having drinks with our new friends. When we came home, we were so happy and content that we didn't even worry about the strange car out front, or that all the lights in the living room were on. We never locked our doors, no one in heaven did, but as soon as I saw the two people in our living room, something snapped inside of me. Mum? Dad, what are you doing here? Eleanor! My mother got up from the sofa and hugged me so tight that all the air left my lungs. Why do you think we're here? You sent me all those strange texts and you wouldn't answer any of my calls. We got worried about you. What texts? Ian asked and I shrugged. I had no idea what she was talking about. She pulled out her phone and showed me dozens of texts from my number. Ian and I decided to stay in heaven. We are so happy here. We need time to ourselves to settle in, and a bunch more like that. Well, I haven't written any of those, but I agree with them. I looked at Ian and he nodded. No, you don't understand, honey. I received the same messages from your aunt when she moved here. Exactly the same ones, word for word. I should have questioned it more then, but... So what? It is great here. Why don't you stay for a while? I'm sure you'll understand then. Eleanor, have you lost your mind? This isn't like you. You wouldn't answer any of our calls or... My father started raging, but then Mum turned around to look at him. I couldn't see her expression, but my dad suddenly got silent. Actually, I think that sounds like a terrific idea, she said. The four of us had a nice dinner and went to bed quickly after. When I woke up, I was in the back seat of a car, with Ian fully passed out next to me. My father was sitting behind the wheel with my mother in the passenger seat. Mum? I mumbled, slowly coming to my senses. Where are you taking us? We have to go back. Suddenly my heartbeat started racing. My mother kept shaking her head. When she turned around I noticed tears in her eyes and a big scratch going down her cheek. I kept blinking a few times. Sleep was claiming me and I could hardly keep my eyes open. The last thing I heard was my mother saying something strange. I don't care that you're an adult. I don't care that that house belongs to you, that place is not right, and I'm not losing you like I lost her. I've been back home for a few days, not in heaven but in my real home, with the family I'd almost forgotten about. I talked to my parents for a long time. Dad doesn't understand anything and thinks Ian and I lost our minds, but Mum seems to get it, especially after I told her about the note I found. She's trying everything to keep my mind sharp, hardly ever leaving my side. I've been strong so far, with her support, but I can't say the same for Ian. He seemed cooperative at first and listened to my parents. I thought we might be able to get through this, but yesterday he disappeared without even a goodbye, and I have a damn good hunch where he went.